This weekend sees Formula One return to Istanbul Park for the Turkish Grand Prix, where Lewis Hamilton can win a record equaling seventh world championship should he finish on the top step on Sunday. After winning the last three races on the bounce, can anyone stop the potential champion elect? Welcome to the podcast. Today we'll be previewing the Turkish Grand Prix. Hosting today will be me, Ruby Price, and joining me will be engineering student, Wayne Medford. Hello. Broadcast journalist, Louis Edwards. Hello. And F1 writer, Gary Sloan. Hi there. So the big news this week, which has come as a somewhat of a bombshell to some F1 fans, is that F1 will officially be racing in the streets of Jeddah for the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. Now, Owain, does this mean that F1 really races as one? Why do you have to ask a tricky question? I've, I've read a number of articles on this, and I can see both sides to it, but I don't think... Like, you know, a Formula E has obviously raced in Saudi Arabia in the past, and they seem to be on a sort of charm offensive when it comes to the various sporting events, but that includes the WWE. So I'm not entirely sure that's maybe the best way to be doing it, particularly when a country where FIBA drivers, FIBA women weren't allowed to drive until fairly recently, and they recently held a Formula One race. I'm not sure going about change in Saudi Arabia by saying you must do this to hold a Formula One race is the best way to do it. I prefer we kept it. Formula One to a a standard of once you meet these criteria, then we will sort of give you the exposure. I don't want to put it in that. I don't, I don't think it would be worded in that strong terms, but I think that should be sort of the underlying sentiment behind it because I'm not sure, bearing in mind Saudi Arabia's sort of human rights violations and the sort of culture of the country is what we want to be supporting really it's this you know it's the same issue with the Qatar World Cup I don't think it's as a sort of global community of sports people we should be sort of promoting that. Mm. Louis the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix joins six more circuits on the calendar for 2021 where like equality is essentially you know basically a myth you know we've got Azerbaijan, Hungary, Singapore, Russia, the USA, Abu Dhabi and then also potentially like China, Bahrain, Brazil. This doesn't, that's near, That's basically a third of the calendar. That doesn't, that's not comforting for someone who's, you know, potentially a minority, like, and a Formula One fan. Yeah, it's, it's never a, a good sign. But, you know, you're saying like, to, you say to a way, and like, does F1 really race as one? Have we ever raced as one in F1? I don't think we have. I think, you know, the decision to go on in, Bahrain has always been a controversial one, especially when all the Arab Spring stuff was going on. America, especially in the south of America, where it's just a mess. As you said, Hungary. There's just so many countries that we go to that have pretty appalling sort of reputations when it comes to human rights and equality that it's just sort of begs the question just, Like, why do we continue to keep going to these countries? I mean, I can answer that question. It's money and a lot of money. And the Saudis are definitely pumping a lot of money into Liberty Media's pocket for this race. I think that's why. So some of us were, you know, when it was announced, it's like, well, we're not surprised. We're just disappointed. Mm. And Gary, there's been like suggestions that people should be boycotting this race. Media companies, the F1 drivers themselves, F1 teams, sponsors, is a boycott, would a boycott work? Do you think a boycott could happen? Do you think it would make a difference at all? Well, it's not whether it would work or not. It's just not going to happen. This is purely and simply about one thing, which is money, which involves the TV companies, the teams, the sponsors. I mean, F1 goes to a lot of countries that probably shouldn't race in. This has been going on since Bernie Eccleston went on his drive to maximise the revenues I mean, to put it into context, the Saudis, they're pumping money into the sport like there's no tomorrow. They're now a global partner of F1. They've got the circuit, the race. They went into bed with Liberty Media on their Live Nation. They're now a shareholder there. So they're using their financial leverage because they want the global publicity. So you're not going to stop it. I mean, they're paying something in the region of $50 million to host this race. And if we go back, the reason Turkey fell off the calendar was it used to pay 20 million of 30 million of that was from the Turkish government. And then the Turkish government said, we can't afford to pay this anymore. So they pulled out and it's only came back because private companies have come back involved in Turkey. 
but they're probably getting paid off Liberty Media this year to stage it. So it's it's about money. I mean, you're you're not and you're not going to change that fact. Formula One revolves around money, so they can talk about boycotts. It's just not going to happen. Mm, absolutely, I guess that is certainly true. I think it would be nice to see like the companies that have been preaching their message that like that you know parallels the in like word form at least the We Races one. It would be nice to see them say something, but we know what Saudi Arabia's relationship with journalists is. And I'm pretty sure, you know, we all remember Jamal uh, Khashoggi in 2018 being, you know, murdered for, essentially murdered for doing her job, you know. But I think it's also important to remember that this is being, the Jeddah Street race is being built as a stopgap, essentially, with a circuit being built in terms of 2023. So there is the potential to stop something if nothing is actually being put in place yet, I think. Yes, say about company. I mean, if you go back to Bahrain when the Arab Spring was on, Vodafone was the title sponsor of Mercedes. So Vodafone said to McLaren, We don't want our logos on the car, take them off. And McLaren refused because they're owned by the Bahrainian royal family. So mm. all Vodafone did was withdraw from the sport. So they walked. So some companies will, like what you said, some companies are making these statements, but they have to back up latch and they have to follow Vodafone's lead and walk. Mm. I think that's definitely what, you know, it's got to be a all or nothing, I think, and if you're going to do a boycott. And, you know, it's like a lot of people saying that Lewis Hamilton should do like a boycott for the Bahrain at the end of the season. It probably would mean nothing from the sense that he's he could win the championship this season anyway. And a lot of people, you know, would accuse him of being a hypocrite for not doing it for other circuits or whatever. But, yeah, I guess let's move on to some other news then, I guess. Owain... They announced that F2 and F3 will be implementing some cost-cutting measures from the 2021 season, three races per weekend, and they're going to be using the same car design, I think it was, for a three-year cycle. Yeah, I think that's a good move, particularly in the current climate. I don't think, I mean, bearing in mind, you know, F, F2 and F3 aren't, aren't reliant, obviously it's a spec car, so they don't rely on technical development or anything like that. I think it also, it might actually be a way to sort of, not well, yeah, even the field basically, because obviously if they're using the same car design, then, you know, maybe the teams with a little bit less money can work out the car a little bit better, work out the best sort of setups for calendar for, for those three years, and and hopefully the, the better drivers will rise to the top a little bit faster. I'm not saying it's going to be, you know, a massive change or anything like that, but you know, it, that might help the team sort of spend less as well. And that, you know, that, that this has a number of benefits and especially with using a slightly different calendar and doing three races per weekend, that does, that gives a lot of opportunities to save, you know, save the pennies where, you know, it's not, it's not going to be big measures, obviously, but those, those tiny little savings should help. Mm, absolutely. Louis, another news thing that broke this weekend, the Bahrain Grand Prix, the spectators, because they're allowing spectators at the Bahrain Grand Prix for the end of the season, the spectators, they've said, will be limited to frontline health workers. Do you think that's a wise decision? Well, it's a nice gesture from Bahrain, but whether or not any of the frontline workers will actually be available for the Grand Prix <laughs> yeah. is, a, is, a, is another thing. But that, it, is, it is a nice gesture from Bahrain government, most likely. And yeah, it, I think we've all enjoyed that spectators have been able to come to the races recently, and, you know, hopefully that will continue as we sort of move on into next season. I know some probably won't probably have a crowd for the British Grand Prix next year, most likely, because, but, you know, I think we're going to see definitely next season, we're going to probably see an increase in the amount of races that have a crowd there, which is, which is always good for the sport. Mm. And let's move on then to the Turkish Grand Prix preview for, you know, the actual race weekend. Gary. I've mentioned in the intro that Lewis Hamilton could walk away this weekend with the seventh driver's world title. Surely, with the form he's been in, he's going to do it this weekend. Yeah, there's a technicality here, but because for it to be a world-recognised FIA World Championship, we have to have 15 races. So even though he might win the title this weekend, unless we didn't have another two races, it won't count in the history books. Given the COVID outbreak we just had in the Williams team, it could quite easily fall round about him. So I think you know, if he does win it, it'd be a bit of a muted on hold celebration till they get over the 15 race mark. But I'm saying that if you were a betting man, your money would be going on it. It's hard to see how we're going to stop him this season. Bad luck's the only thing that's going to stop him. 
Yeah, I think as well, like the characteristic as well that we've seen over the last couple of races, you know, he's fallen back at the start, but he's, you know, he's managed to get back into the leading positions and, you know... He's got such a experience and skill set. And he's a racer through and through and through. So even when he's asked, will he settle for second, which is all he needs, he's like, no, I want to win it, you know? Mm. He just doesn't hope. He just has to hope that Verstappen or a Kiva, you know, a straight a wandering stroll doesn't take him out. <laughs> yeah, the only man really that can stop him away in this weekend is Valtteri Bottas, and that requires Bottas to be on the top step. But other than that, that's enough to consider a Lewis Hamilton victory. And I don't think Valtteri's got it in him. Do you? I mean, I saw you saw a sort of resurgence of Valtteri last weekend, but the sort of you know we don't know that what the effect of the damage would be was on Valtteri's car. You know, bearing in mind it was running Ferrari aero parts, it's, you know, it's probably not not great. But uh, I just it it feels like kind of when Jensen Button had five races that he could have won the title if he'd won every single race, and you know, and and Sebastian Vettel had. had crashed out of every single one is yeah technically a possibility but i don't see that happening the form book basically guarantees that you know lewis hamilton will be out of mathematical reach of anyone to come sort of come a week's time mm. so louis at least one of the red bull drivers this weekend will presumably have a strong showing provided he finishes the other one will have a very long weekend what do you reckon red bull's chances are for the turkish grand prix they won the last turkish grand prix if we're going to do what Sky Sports do and constantly refer back to the last race that happened nearly a decade ago. The form book's good for Red Bull, at least, in this circuit. Yeah, and as you mentioned, Alex Albon, he's going to have a great race. Max Verstappen's going to have an absolutely miserable <laughs> race this weekend, as always. I mean, Red Bull will probably fancy their chances, but I think realistically, it's probably going to be settling for third. Yet again, you know as long as the tie doesn't go kabang again. But, you know, Verstappen is a great driver, and I think this track is one that he'll adapt to very quickly, and I think we'll see a lot of good from Verstappen. Albon, you know, he's still someone who is fighting for his career, but he looks like he's down and out. So pretty much going to have to rely on Verstappen to get a, a good result out of this weekend. Mm. On that note, uh, Gary, do you think Albon has any potential to save his Red Bull career? Do you think like another podium could put him back um, into contention? Well, I think what's going on here is that the joint owner of Red Bull is a tie. So Dietrich Maestricht's business partner is a tie. And I think he's the one that's holding the strings just now. So there's probably internal wrangling. If it was down to Red Bull, Marco and Horner, Alvin would have been long gone. I mean, that's, that's how they operate. So the paddock's been scratching its head. Why is Alvin still having a chance. It's purely down to the Thai backer, what a Thai, London-born Thai driver in the series. So, I mean, if he, I mean, Horner was out yesterday saying, he's, you know, they still want him to retain the drive. So, and the, the guy's got skill, I just think he's had the stuff and knocked out of him. But it might well go down to other things apart from racing. It might be a battle of the wills at the top of Red Bull. Give him another season. They might do a might do a trade off that they'll let him have another season, and if he's not improved for the first three four races the next season, then he gets chopped. Mm. But he needs a strong performance. Yeah, absolutely. Like I think if he's not, you know, it's pretty clear that he he doesn't currently have the. If he has the ability, he doesn't have the confidence to match Verstappen. But currently, he's not really showing that he's got the ability to match Verstappen either. So, you know, I think if he's not finishing in the top six then he's, you know, having a really bad race based on the performance of that car, at least anyway. Oh, Wayne, let's move on to one of the happiest men in the paddock at the minute. Daniel Ricciardo got his second podium last race weekend. Renault could potentially be a complete outlier again for this weekend to end up on the podium yet again. Yeah, it's a somewhat similar circuit, I'd say. And yeah, it could actually provide the sort of well, it's going to be Sky Sports talking about tattoos all over, all over again, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I don't see Ocon getting it personally. I think Ricardo sort of he's he's on a little bit of form as well, which is probably helping his chances. And with sort of two wins quite recently, that's oh no, sorry, not two wins, two podiums quite recently, which is the best you can hope for in a cart like that. A little bit of sort of 
craziness, I guess, in the race, some new eventualities could actually bring him up back into the podium positions and, and give him a good race. Mm, absolutely. There's only one point as well separating Renault in third and Racing Point in fifth. So it's a shoey in that those standings will change by the end of the weekend. <laughs> Louis, McLaren as well then being in fourth, you know, We've talked about McLaren's troubles before, like they went th- through a completely different aerodynamic model and stuff with their developments and it it didn't work. So they've been trying to undo that essentially. Do you think that, you know, if they find the secret to that, that they could have a strong weekend this weekend? Yeah, I think they can. It's, in all honesty, I think it was just McLaren trying something out for next season. You know, they've got it would make sense to go with a Mercedes style aero package when you're going to have a Mercedes engine. So I think they were just trying something out and yeah, it backfired a bit and now they're sort of scrambling back to their old self. But I think it could be a good weekend from McLaren. It just depends on, you know, what car they bring, you know, even in the races where they've been doing pretty poor, they've still been scraping out, you know, good lot of points, which has kept them in this constructors battle. So they're not completely out of the water. And I think, you know, a good clean race could could see them. Well, I don't know if they'll take third, but I think it's still very much being contention. Mm. And Gary, the third team in this battle for third racing point, one of their drivers appears to be doing really well and very much putting on a you know performance that could potentially save his career, whilst the other one appears to be having a complete, essentially on track meltdown. Lance Stroll's not been having the start of the season performance that he had certainly you know showed. Well, the racing point PR machines and overdrive now spinning it that's down to COVID. I mean, one of the one of the signs of COVID's brain fog, which could explain some of his driving errors in the last couple of races. So they're they're spinning it that he's physically, and mentally been affected with COVID, even though it was a short illness, but it was just sort of long COVID, and that's that's what's knocked him off 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 his form. Whether it's true or not, it's it's a good spin to have. I think there are market people who like it. Perez. He just keeps delivering, and it's in his best interest to keep delivering. Although I don't think he's got any. I think you know other factors will decide whether he gets his seat as a race or not next season. But I think Stroll, he can't have another performance this weekend where he's making rookie errors and taking drivers off, or he'll, he will start again. That'll start to stick to him, and he doesn't want that. Mm, absolutely, like that was the reason why people have been arguing all this season that he doesn't deserve a seat for next season. Returning to that kind of you know consistent drive of mistakes and stuff like that, that's going to you know that's going to land him out of a seat. To be fair to him, he's a bit damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. If he doesn't get anywhere, it's well he's only in Formula One because of his dad's money. If he does a good job, it's well he's only doing a good job because of his dad's money. So. I think sometimes you should cut the guy a bit of slack. It must be hard having a rich father on one hand as well as the benefits. There's a downside, you know. So to be fair to the guy, he always says he lets his talking on, does his talking on the track. Well, he's been a bit silent this last couple of races. Mm. And the things he has been saying weren't the things to be proud of. (laughs) No. But Owen, let's talk about a somewhat resurgent Ferrari. Like they have at least finally made it to triple figures in terms of their points. And there is one driver to thank for that, Charles Leclerc, who, if we're going to place you know, any bets this weekend, Charles Leclerc is going to be the lead Ferrari car this weekend, isn't he? I mean, almost certainly. It's been the case almost. Well, it has been the case all season. You know, absolutely. He's putting Sebastian Vettel to a bit of shame, really. So, you know, he's, he seems to be in great form. He's always vastly out-qualifying what the car is should be capable of. Even if we say, say the fourth best car, he's still couple of positions above that sometimes breaking into the top four which is absolutely excellent <laughs> Ferrari were fastest all season fast as they've been all season last weekend and not just because they were stuck to a bit of Mercedes you know it's they're sort of showing the signs that they're coming back I think it's still going to be a long road ahead particularly next season I think there were rumors that they were going for an all, all new engine so we'll have to see what that brings when it comes to next season but with the sort of change that they've made more recently that's actually seems to have been driving their performance um, I think it should be a fairly decent weekend for them Mm. as much as i've been enjoying the ferrari based humor like it's been somewhat satisfactory to see them being able to hold their own in a race rather than just being a movable chicane but louis let's talk about the other italian team well the other main italian team that has any you know chances of 
scoring decent points. Alpha Towery. Pierre Gasly needs a good race this weekend, like just purely for his own confidence, really. Whereas Daniel Kvyat just needs a good race to be like, hi, I'm still here. So what do you reckon their chances are this weekend? I mean, we're saying uh, Turkey's very similar to Imola and they had its outstanding pace. You know, I'd say it's faster than the sort of this three that were, you know, that are fighting for the third and constructors. They were doing incredibly well. And yeah, Pierre will probably want to finish this race. You know, he, he was on for such a good result last week. Uh, well, yeah, it was last weekend. But it's just, yeah, he just needs to sort of just do what he's been doing. He's, you know, showing that he's an incredibly quick driver and he just needs to continue with that. And Kibir, I think his performance in Imola was a little too, uh, too little too late. And I think he's probably going to be on his way out. But it's not, to, it's not to say that if he keeps performing, he might get picked up by another team. Of course, when he, when he left Toronto, he got picked up by Ferrari to be a develop, uh, well, a sim driver. So he's still got to make his presence known. And yeah, hopefully he can, he can do something. Mm. So Gary, Alfa Romeo, Kimi's got his seat. Well, they've, both drivers have got their seats confirmed for next season, which will have hopefully put something of a spring in their engine at least. So if there's collisions ahead they have a good chance for points i mean kimmy finished ninth last weekend in imola um but that might have been because of how difficult it was to overtake and how long he managed to go he could have finished even further ahead if he's just waited two laps a bit but you know it's a different circuit but very similar to imola if he gets up into those positions do you think alfa romeo could stay there it's possible i think for both the drivers i think they want to reward the team for giving them their seats without sounding like a broken record. It was about money in Giovanzi's case, Alfa Romeo. You know, remember, this is still, I know it's called Alfa Romeo, it's still the Sauber racing team. Alfa Romeo had the naming rights to so just sign for another year. And they were adamant that they wanted an Italian driver, absolutely adamant. They went, they went to sign, so he had to get his seat. So he's got in, you know, effectively as a paid driver. So I think he'll have to have a strong performance to reward Alfa Romeo for that. And I think Raikkonen, yeah, I mean, it's hard to always tell how what motivates Kimi, you know. I think his little opening lap in Imola will have buoyed him up. So and I think he's got the race craft to stay ahead, keep guys behind him. But I think it's a tall order for them. I don't think the package is strong enough. Mm. It's a bit I mean, like you... Russell getting so far and then <laughs> you, you keep your fingers crossed, but you're thinking, don't think so. Yeah, but on the on the point of the race starts as well, Giovinazzi's been making some electric starts. You know, mm, I think he I yeah, think he was absolutely. up eight positions at the end of the first lap, if not just a little bit further in at Imola. So I think he's one of these drivers that people wrote him off too soon. Uh, he did have some horrendous driver. like fill-ins when he uh, came in at Salva, didn't he? So yeah. yeah, I can understand why people would have written him off, but I think. Obviously, Formula One isn't that kind of environment where you can allow people to grow necessarily because it is a very harsh environment and, you know, you need those positions now. But, like, sometimes you've just got to give those drivers the opportunity to, you know, get their confidence in the car, get their confidence in their own abilities, and then you start seeing their skill. It's always the case that, you know, when they're looking at chopping a driver or bringing up so-and-so who's coming through the ranks has got the talent, but the driver they're chopping was in exactly that same position, was a driver coming through the ranks with immense talent. So there's no guarantee that once they hit a Formula One seat that that, that continues. So there's always that risk factor for teams that they think, oh, well, let's pick this guy to the top F2 and put him in a car. But it could easily go the way. We've seen when, you know, Gasly and Kiavat got even promoted to the Red Bull team. They, they didn't hack it and they had to drop back down again. So it's a tricky balance for teams. It's not quite as straightforward as it always seems. Mm. And one of the drivers who benefited and fell on the like wayside of that as well, uh, Kevin Magnussen, away for Haas, you know, leaving Haas at the end of the season as his his teammate Grosjean, like they'll be trying to just put in some last season claims for you know something post this post twenty twenty. Yeah, I don't see them getting a seat inside the sport, so it does make worry for their long-term mo- motorsports futures. Although, to be fair, I'm sure they'll find something. Yeah, but it's just kind of, yeah, at this point, it's sort of filling up their sort of portfolio of, of abilities and making their CVs look a little bit better, at least. 
you know, at least they can, they can sort of claim, well, we're in a house, so it wasn't going exactly going to go amazingly. But sort of with the low amount of points they've scored this season, and they're very few and far between, you know, even being challenged by the Williams, which used to be a long way back from them. It's just kind of, I don't think the car's in a place to, to allow them to challenge for anything, really. And they're sort of, yeah, you know, like you say, they're kind of on their way out now. Mm. And Williams will Louis will be looking for something a bit less a bit less smashing, but actually a smashing result. You know, Russell, he's gonna probably do well on Saturday and let us down on Sunday. And Latifi's gonna get close to Russell, but you know, we'll ultimately either finish behind him or we'll finish. You know, it's gonna be a long weekend for Williams, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's 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 such a shame. It's such a shame. <laughs> But it's, yeah, it's just going to be probably another case of Jaws gets it to Q2, he'll probably drop back a few positions, fight alongside the Alfa Romeo, the Haas. And I think that'll be pretty much their weekend. You know, after coming so close to points, I think Williams know that points definitely on the horizon for them. It's just when they're going to come. And I don't think they're going to come this season. I think it's still a little sort of that car's just not that good in the race, you know, at the start of the season, we were constantly saying that well, the Williams is great in qualifying, but it's terrible in the race. And while its race pace has got better, it's still not good enough to score points. But I could be wrong. You never know. You never know with George in that in that car. He can pull out a blinder sort of out of nowhere. But I, I, yeah, I think it will be just a sort of a standard race for Williams. Not too much excitement. Mm. Without a safety car and ten crashes, it's gonna be a you know a non points finish for Williams this weekend. But that's the teams at least. So on to our top three predictions. Gary, who's gonna be on the podium for you this weekend? Well, I'll stick to what I thought last thing. I still think Bottas has got a win in them. Hamilton second, and I would fancy Ricardo for third. Ooh, Owen. I just want to go Hambot for her. I can't do that every week, can I? It's okay, you'll change it by the time the qualifying... I won't change it. I don't know where I've got this reputation from. (laughs) Apart from obviously changing it. (laughs) (laughs) I went up on one time. Probably Hamilton for the win, because it just seems kind of... It doesn't matter what Valtteri does, really. I think... uh, I don't know. I'll I'll, I'll go for Stappen second, because that seems like he feels like... I feel like he'll sort of really enjoy Istanbul. I'm going to go Norris for third. There we go. Interesting. Louis? Yeah, Hamilton again, probably going to win. The odds probably also go with Verstappen second, but I'm going to put Perez on the podium for mm. third. I'm going to go very boring and say Hamilton, Bottas, Verstappen, because that's <sighs> the kind of weekend I'm expecting. I tried not to do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to try not to do it, but this is my actual prediction, whereas my bold prediction is coming up next. So, Gary, what's your bold prediction for the weekend? Well, I said last time round that when you're under the sort of pressure albums under a year, pull off a miracle or you have a disaster. There's not a middle ground. And let's face it, he finished last week. He's had his disaster. So I'm going for the miracle this time round. I'm going for him to win the race. Albon to win the race? Yep. Red Bulls all round. (laughs) Owen? Can I go Russell for points again? I think I can. Russell for points again. <laughs> Louis? I'm going to go with my impossible prediction that everyone keeps saying, but Vettel to beat Leclerc, not not through incident, but on pure pace. Vettel to beat Leclerc on pure pace. Now that is bold. I'm going to... Some would say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say three Ferrari-powered cars in the top ten. Christ. <laughs> no, that's bold. We <laughs> Ruby, <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> the silent spoke volumes. Exactly. It's a bold prediction. If it if it looked like it was going to be easy, you know, it would be in the, you know, prediction. But you know, that's the show. We're now available on Amazon Music, YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, uh, Omni Studio, Pocket Cast. Just search F1 Grid Talk. We have a huge back catalogue of shows. This is episode 73. Got previews, reviews and reactions to the qualifying and the race results of the Grand Prix weekends. Got a Reddit. Just search for the subreddit F1 Grid Talk. And we also have a Patreon for mics, lights and better recording equipment for our presenters. 
We'll be back on Saturday to review the Turkish Grand Prix qualifying. Thank you very much to my panellists for joining me. No worries. Cheers. And we will be sticking around on Facebook for the Facebook post show if anyone has got any questions and stuff like that. But other than that, thank you very much for listening and goodbye.